Hello YouTube, this is the Phenomenological Thomas, and my name is Sterling. Today we're going to be presenting Biological Naturalism as understood by John Searle. The primary texts which will serve as a basis of this essay are The Rediscovery of the Mind by John Searle, which we'll be focusing on, and the two accessory texts will be The Blackwell Philosophy Anthology of Mind and Cognition and Mind, Matter, and Nature by James Madden. With all this being said, this is not intended to be an extensive explication of Searle's theory and its complexities, nor complete refutation of said theory. Instead, the focus will be on attempting to charitably interpret Searle's theory while offering objections and brief responses. Due to this, the focus will be on what Searle thinks about the given positions, so giving extensive replies to each thought will not be done in this preliminary essay. Further, this essay generally relies on his uh, the rediscovery of the mind as the presentation of his theory. Thus there, are, thus, there are more arguments in various papers, but we're not going to be focusing on those. Some biographical information about John Searle. He is an American philosopher born in Denver, Colorado, who teaches out of the University of California, Berkeley. I believe he still teaches there. I'm not sure there was a controversy recently. He's perhaps most famous in the public square for his Chinese room experiment argument presented in Minds, Brains, and Programs. However, his biggest philosophical contribution has undoubtedly been his biological naturalism. Biological naturalism itself can be difficult to categorize because of the philosophical influences from which it was born and what the implications of such a position might entail. Many have accused biological naturalism to look suspiciously like property dualism. Searle maintains that it is perfectly consistent with physicalism, or at least naturalism. Many have taken to identifying this position with emergentism. In order to comprehend biological naturalism, it is necessary to understand the context in which Searle derives his conclusions. Just as with any revolutionary philosopher, Searle's theory arises out of a particular set of philosophical conditions and historical background. I have been concerned not so much to defend or refute materialism as to examine the vicissitudes in the face of certain common sense facts about the mind, such as the fact that most of us are, for most of our lives, conscious. What we find in the history of materialism is a recurring tension between the urge to give an account of reality that leaves out any reference to special features of the mental, such as consciousness and subjectivity, and at the same time account for our intuitions about the mind. It is, of course, impossible to do these two things. So there are a series of attempts, almost neurotic in character, to cover the fact that some crucial element about mental states is being left out. And when it's pointed out that some obvious truth is being denied by the materialist philosophies, the upholders of the view almost invariably resort to certain rhetorical strategies. The Rediscovery of the Mind, page 52. Searle finds many flaws within both materialism and dualism. In fact, in order to understand his biological naturalism, one must see why he's not only so opposed to materialism, and dualism, but why he sees the mind-body problem as a philosophical pseudo-problem. When Searle talks about materialism, it's important to understand what he's referring to is so-called reductive materialism. That is, any type of materialist philosophy which reduces mental states to physical states. There are many different forms of this philosophy, and indeed Searle has a wide variety of responses for the respective types. Um, we're just going to be focusing on his responses in this video to each of the respective types. The forms of reductive physicalism which he addresses in the book are as follows. Logical behaviorism, type identity theory, token identity theory, black box functionalism, eliminative materialism, Turing machine functionalism, and naturalizing intentionality. For brevity's sake, it is only necessary within the scope of this essay to review logical behaviorism, type and token identity theory, black box functionalism, and eliminative materialism. If the listener is interested, feel free to check out Searle's book for the rest of the materialist philosophies. Logical behaviorism arose out of psychology from methodological behaviorism. Essentially, the thesis was that where research is concerned, we ought to be concerned with the stimulus and reaction or behavior without consideration for speculations about the internal mental state. Logical behaviorism goes one step further in stating that mental states can be defined in terms of behavior. So to say Sterling desires to be a chess player simply means he does things which a chess player is apt to do or feels a certain way about playing chess. I have already had an occasion to argue that a number of words which we commonly use to describe and explain people's behavior signify dispositions and not episodes. To say that a person knows something or aspires to be something 
This does not say that he is at a particular moment in the process of doing or undergoing anything, but that he's prone to do certain things when the need arises, or that he is prone to do and feel certain things in situations of certain sorts. Gilbert Ryle, Concept of Mind, page 106. Searle tends to divide his objections into technical objections and commonsensical objections for each materialist philosophy. It should be noted that the commonsensical objection that Searle considers to be most embarrassing for behavioralism reveals the absurdity of disbelieving that internal mental states exist. Clearly we know during our own conscious experience that at least our behavior is not identical to our mental experience. In terms of technical objections, Searle maintains that no one has given an adequate account of mental terms and fully behavioral terms. He specifically objects to the notion of disposition. Secondly, he appears to conclude that there is a circular nature in the theory, specifically in respect that giving an analysis of belief in terms of behavior, it seems that one has to make reference to belief. Thus, if we are trying to analyze the hypothesis that John believes that it is going to rain in terms of the hypothesis that if the windows are open, John will close them and a similar hypothesis. We want to analyze the categorical statement that John believes that is going to rain in terms of certain hypothetical statements about what John will do under what conditions. However, John's belief that it's going to rain will be manifested in the behavior of closing the windows only if we assume such additional hypotheses as that John doesn't want the rainwater to come in through the windows and John believes that open windows admit rainwater. Without some such hypothesis about John's desires and his other beliefs, it looks as if we cannot begin to analyze any sentence about his original beliefs. Similar remarks can be made about the analysis of desires. Such analyses seem to require reference to beliefs. Page 34, The Rediscovery of the Mind. The objection here is that in order to give any positive accounts of John's behavior in purely behavioral terms, it is necessary to make reference to his beliefs, since the only way to analyze categorical statements like this is in terms of what John believes, especially because categorical statements such as these make assumptions which are inherently desire or belief-based, as with the example of not desiring rainwater to come in. Searle then progresses to identity theories, which are a bit more nuanced than logical behaviorism, in that they admit the existence of internal mental states, which Searle certainly sees as an improvement. Identity theories claim that internal mental states are in some way identical with brain states. However, when philosophers of mind speak about the identity in this case, they are not referring to a logical identity, but a contingent empirical identity. For example, it's quite different to suggest one is one than it would be to suggest water is H2O. While both of these statements are true, one is trivially true and knowable by simple conceptual analysis and consistent definitions while the other must be discovered by empirical investigation, despite being identical. Kripke famously uses this as an example of an a priori synthetic truth. Further, they are contingent ent entities, since that there could be a set of conditions where the identities could fail to be identical, such as there could be a possible universe where H2O isn't water. Consider the famous Freudian example of Hesperus, the evening star, and Phosphorus, the morning star, while the identity statement, Hesperus is Phosphorus, or the evening star is the morning star, is a true identity statement which is necessary, the morning star and the evening star are distinct concepts. Thus, while the identity statement, the morning star is the evening star, is factually true, it's not necessarily true since the concepts are not directly related. In fact, one could be quite familiar with the morning star in concept while doubting the existence of the evening star. Identity theorists reason this in this way with brain states. Notice how even though there is a conceptual difference between water and H2O, yet through empirical investigation we can discover these things are identical. And with similarly with the morning and the evening star, we can discover that those things are identical, even though the concepts are different. What identity theory does allow is for conceptual differences between certain mental states and certain brain states. For example, uh, taken from My Matter and Nature by James Madden, Take the statement, Paul sees blue. A convolutional neural network is active in Paul's brain. Clearly, these statements are not identical in meaning, and one could know the meaning of one without knowing the other. However, identity theorists claim that Paul sees blue is a convolutional neural network is active in Paul's brain is a contingent empirical identity. As J.J. Smart put it, sensations are nothing over and above brain processes. Nations are nothing over and above citizens. 
but this does not prevent the logic of nation statements being very different from the logic of citizen statements, nor does it ensure the translatability of nation statements into citizen statements. It's important to realize that identity theory is not a limitative materialism. Unlike a limitative materialism, identity theory does recognize the existence of the psychological states, so the sensation and the thoughts are real, but they are nothing above brain processes. It is important to make the distinction between two different versions of identity theory, especially since Searle will necessarily have different objections to each different version. First is the difference between type and token in general. A type is a kind of sort of thing, or a universal. A token is an example of a thing. So, my office chair and my dining room chair are both chairs, they're both types, or they're both tokens of the type of chair. So they're, so, they're examples of chairs, while chair is kind of the concept that's over and above any particular chair. Or my computer is a token of the type computer, my dog is a token of the type Newfoundland for example. So for type identity theorists, there's simply no difference between having a pain and having a convolutional neural network activation. However, for token identity, essentially it aims to take into account what Ned Block articulates here. In saying that mental states are brain states, for example, physicalists unfairly exclude those poor brainless creatures who nevertheless have minds. Essentially what token identity theory is attempting to take into account is the possibility of there being creatures, for example, aliens or computers that may not yet have the underlying neurological biology that we do, or may not have the neurological biology at all in the case of aliens. For token identity theory, it is at least theoretically possible that a psychological state, or the psychological state, of seeing red is realizable in many different physical states. So essentially, instead of saying that every, physio- uh, every psychological state there exists some equivalent brain state. Instead, token identity theory will say that for every psychological state, there exists an equivalent physical state. Now that you have all of the requisite philosophical background out the way, what are Searle's objections? His commonsensical objection to type identity theory is the following. It's a dilemma. Essentially, Searle claims that either type identity theory leaves out the mind or becomes property dualism. If, for example, pains are identical with neurophysiological events, then there must be two sets of features, pain features and neurophysiological features. And these two sets of features enable us to nail down both sides of the synthetic identity statement. Thus, for example, suppose we have a statement of the form, pain event X is identical with neurophysiological event Y. We understand such a statement because we understand that one and the same event has been identified in virtue of two different sorts of properties, pain properties and neurophysiological properties. It, but if so, then we seem to be confronted with the dilemma. Either the pain features are subjective, mental, introspective states, or they are not. Well, if they are, then we haven't really gotten rid of the mind. Searle understands this to be just the same critique as with behaviorism, except in the form of a dilemma. Searle clearly has the priority that for any theory of mind to be adequate, it is necessary to address the nature of the mind and not to ignore it. So any type of theory which does this is unacceptable. He finds this unacceptable because it does not adequately represent the phenomena, nor the commonsensical experience of consciousness. Even if the phenomena turns out to not be commonsensical straightforwardly, there has to be an explanation for why this type of phenomena exists. Searle then progresses to address the other form of identity theory, token identity theory. Primarily, he thinks that token identity theory inherits the dilemma of type identity theory, and thus extending the argument further. Furthermore, he thinks that there are more problems with token identity theory. His more technical objection is what do different neurophysiological states have in common sufficient that two different states produce the same mental states? The token theorists cannot reply that they are of the same type because their position does not allow for that type of argumentation, else they revert back to the type identity theorist. They also cannot say the mental features are what's in common since there are supposed to be nothing above the neurophysiological processes. If you and I both believe that Denver is the capital of Colorado, then what is it that we have in common that makes our different neurophysiological squiggles the same belief? They cannot say that it's what makes two neurophysiological events of the same type of mental event 
is that it has the same type of mental features. Because it was precisely the elimination or reduction of these mental features that materialism sought to achieve. They must find some non-mentalistic answer to the question, what is it about two neurophysiological states that make them into tokens of the same type of mental state? Given the entire tradition within which they were working, the only plausible answer was one in the behaviorist style. Their answer was that a neurophysiological state was a particular mental state in virtue of its function, and that naturally leads us to the next view, page 40. The next materialist theory that he addresses is what he calls black box functionalism. Uh, he does this to contrast it with what he identifies as strong AI, or Turing box functionalism. However, black box functionalism is often called simply functionalism, or functionalism, simply functionalism. Essentially, Searle sees functionalism as the answer to the problem raised earlier. What is the thing which unites two neurophysiological states that makes them token of the same mental state? The answer that the functionalist will give is that the two brain states have the same causal relations to input and output stimulus and its various other related brain states. This is why functionalism is sometimes called black box functionalism, because it treats the mind as a kind of box where the casual relations occur. As Searle notes, this avoids the common problems of behaviorism, namely the circular nature of behaviors and desires, and the relation between internal mental states. Searle brings another commonsensical and technical objection. On the commonsensical side, it seems like this type of analysis leaves out the qualitative nature of experience. Clearly, we experience phenomena beyond the casual states which they are associated with. For example, the experience of feeling pain, or seeing red, or tasting sweetness, that are independent of the explication of the casual states with which they are associated. Searle even provides an analogy for why this is a problematic way of understanding consciousness. Suppose that one section of the population had their color spectra reversed in such a way that, for example, the experience they call seeing red, a normal person would call seeing green, and what they call seeing green, a normal person would call seeing red. Now we might suppose that this spectrum inversion is entirely undetectable by any of the usual color blindness tests, since the abnormal group makes exactly the same color discriminations in response to exactly the same stimuli as the rest of the population. When asked to put the red pencils in one pile and the green pencils in another, they do it exactly the way the rest of us would do. It looks different to them on the inside, but there's no way to detect this difference on the outside. Now, if this possibility is even intelligible to us, and it surely is, then black box functionalism must be wrong in supposing that neutrally specified casual relations are sufficient to account for mental phenomena. For such specifications leave out a crucial feature of many mental phenomena, namely their qualitative feel, page 42. With regards to the technical objection, Searle thinks that functionalists have failed to give an account for how quite different physical structures with different mental phenomena provide the same causal phenomena, that is, how they are causally equivalent. The final materialist philosophy, which Searle addresses, that will be covered here at least, is eliminative materialism. He presents eliminative materialism as the position which cognitive science will eventually eliminate our commonsensical notions of consciousness, and thus, once it does, we will no longer have need of our folk psychology to explain conscious experience, but merely sufficiently technical explanations of the brain will replace these things. Thus, our theory of mind will eventually explain away the mind. According to Searle, eliminative materialists think that once we have a fully understood version of cognitive science, folk psychological concepts such as belief, desire, hope, fear, elation, will not exactly or remotely match the taxonomy of perfectly understood neurobiology. Therefore, the identities purportedly named by these expressions of folk psychology do not exist. Page 46 to 47. However, he sees this as clearly foolhardy and equivalent to saying that once we have a perfectly understood notion of physics, things such as golf clubs, two-story houses, tennis rackets will not exactly or remotely match the taxonomy of perfectly understood physics and thus do not exist. Searle thinks that the commonsensical objection to eliminative materialism is simply that it is crazy to believe. Prima facie, it seems wrong to suggest that we never have thoughts or desires or beliefs, and that those really don't make an impact on our behavior. He says the technical objection to eliminative materialism is to mount a defense of folk psychology. He says it's hard to imagine how an eliminative materialist could really show 
that some of the common sense folk psychological ideas could be refuted empirically. He gives three good examples. In general, beliefs can be true or false. Sometimes people get hungry and they often want to eat something. Pains are unpleasant and for that reason people tend to avoid them. Page 62. He claims that when these critiques are brought up to supporters of limited materialism, they often just brush them off and retreat into scientific triumphalism. And that's all we have time to cover for today. Next time we're going to go further into details about uh, Searle's views and some of his critiques of dualism as well. Thank you.